Last week, of course, we had homecoming. And uh, we spoke here last week a little bit uh, before the singers came up and before Brother Dorsal came up. We spoke about the big homecoming, the real homecoming. The real homecoming that one of these days, if we are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, if we have been faithful up until that last, through that last final day, Brother Jim, we're going to the homecoming in the sky. That's not what God's Word calls it. God's Word calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb. How many of you have been to a wedding not too long ago or in the last couple of years? Was the food good? Yes. You know, it always is. You, you can say, well, gee, but it always is for some reason. I, I've never really figured that out. We went to a wedding one time, not, uh, well, it's been several years ago now. Uh, they had it, uh, it was in October, and it was supposed to be really nice weather. Y'all remember that October day that it wasn't nice weather? When the wind blew about 35 degrees and had cold, nasty rain? Well, that's about the way the wedding was. That's about the way the uh, reception was afterwards. The reception was in one of these buildings that's got three sides. Anybody want to guess which way the rain came in? <laughs> the fourth side. Uh, the food was cold. Uh, the, 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 the band, so to speak, that was there, well, they really wasn't much of a band or whatever. Uh, it, the, the reception did not turn out to be one of the best receptions we've ever been to, but it was a good wedding. And the food, even though it was cold, was good. Thank God when we go to this marriage supper of the Lamb, the weather is going to be perfect. Now, Sister Marlene likes it about 84 degrees or 83 or 82, somewhere around in there. Brother Chuck likes it around 62 yeah. or 60 or somewhere around in there. <coughs> Personally, I'm one of these 90 guys myself. I can handle that. And I don't know how God's going to do that. I, I have no idea. Sister Sandy, nobody's going to be looking for the thermostat. Nobody's going to be looking to the left or to the right of them. Who am I sitting next to? And you're not going to have to worry about it because whoever you're sitting next to is a born again, bought by the blood of Jesus, a Christian that made it all the way through just like you did. And maybe you'll sit there and share stories. I don't know. I just know I'm going to be there. And that's what's important. I'm going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And everybody on that end of the table, and everybody on that end of the table, and everybody around are going to be saved. Bought by the blood of Jesus. No thieves, no liars, no murderers. Now there might be a few ex-thieves and ex-liars and ex-murderers all repenting of their sins, forgiven and forgotten. That, that, that's, that's going to be true. But none of them are going to be practicing thieves, muggers, and liars, and murderers. All good Christian people won't have to worry about a thing. And I, you know, when I, when I read about that, it goes on and it starts talking about other things. And I get a little bit sad. Because that means one of, you know, not too long later, Brother Chuck, it's going to be over with. The Mary Supper of the Lamb is going to be done. It's going to be finished. And you know, we've all been to those weddings and the reception is over you look around and napkins all over the place and paper plates didn't get stuffed in the garbage can like they were supposed to. None of that's going to be there. This is going to be heaven. We're not going to have to worry about any of that. It is going to be a good time, but one of these days it will be over and then we'll go on with eternity together. And again, I have no idea, Sister Linda, what we're going to do in eternity. It seems like it's pretty long. It seems like we might get bored. But God promises that the very best we can think of here is not the way it's going to be up there. The most greatest, bestest, whatever word you want to use there, the biggest and highest, most wonderful thing you can think of is not good enough for what heaven's going to be. Eyes not seen, ears not heard. Never entered into the hearts of man. So look forward to that. But we talked about that last week. We talked about the fact that the 
Marriage supper of the Lamb will be with all of the saints of old. Moses is going to be there. Noah is going to be there. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar. We start reading in the book of Daniel, we read about this guy Nebuchadnezzar, where all of a sudden, why that, that low down, that, 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 but we read about how he was converted, how he became a believer. Nebuchadnezzar. And there's legends about some of the most wicked people we've ever heard about, about how at their last time, last opportunity, about how they came around and gave their heart and lives to Jesus Christ. And go ahead, they, you know, one of the things we kind of laugh about up there, and there's a joke that goes around about silence in heaven. Everybody heard the joke about silence in heaven? Guy standing outside in the heaven's gates, and he can hear all the singing going on, and he can hear all the music, and hear all the laughing and everything. He opens the door, and he steps inside, and bang, it goes quiet. He looks around, and there's that guy that stole his motorcycle a few years back. And there's the guy that beat up on his little son. And there's that guy that stole all of his stuff out of, the, out of the back of his car one time. He looks at St. Peter and he says, I've got two questions. He says, number one, how come these people are here? He says, well, they got saved. He says, well, the other question is, how come it's so quiet? He says, well, there's a lot of people here that didn't expect you to be here either. <laughs> we laugh about that. We, you know, it's a little joke. We, we laugh about it. We think about it. Nobody will be surprised when we walk in. Because we will, they will know that we got there the same way they did. Covered by the blood of Jesus. The saints of old, the saints of the New Testament, and today our uh, counterparts throughout the world. Some Christian pastor in Nairobi is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Some Christian pastor in Australia is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Their congregation and us, if the, if the rapture happens today, we meet somewhere in the sky. Praise the Lord, Brother Dave. What a wonderful thought. All of the Christians that are Christians the day Christ comes back. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain, we're going to be changed. We're going to catch them in the air and be with the Lord forever. But uh, we're all going to sit down again at the supper table of the Lamb. And that's kind of what we wanted to talk about this morning. Uh, because that supper table is where Jesus Christ takes his bride, the church. The bride that he died for, the church of Jesus Christ. He takes his bride. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we go on from there. The church is the bride of Christ. And as we get ready to go a little bit further into this this morning, would you bow your heads with me? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your many blessings. Most importantly, we thank you for your Son, Jesus. Ask you, Lord, to be with us this morning in this service. Help us, Father, to look to you, to serve you, to praise you, in all that we do. And help us, Father, to understand and to know that uh, there's really going to be a lot of people in heaven and that there's only one way that we get there and that's through Jesus. Open our hearts, open our minds to your word. We give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, they all say it. Amen. Amen. As we begin to think about the bride of Christ and all that it entails, I wanted to share this one scripture with you right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Paul wrote this particular scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians. It's not in 1 Corinthians. Uh, he wrote two books to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a church that had some problems in it. When I say have some problems in it, it's the same type of problems that Christians had. Because it was a Christian church, they were Christians, but they had not been taught everything that they needed to be taught. And one of, just for example, one of the problems they were having was one of the fellows there that had gotten saved, 
thought that he should be able to talk his father into divorcing his stepmother so that he could marry his stepmother. Now we all look at that and say, well, that's, I wouldn't do that. But that's because we know better. In the society that this man grew up in, that was an allowable thing. That was no big deal. If you could, if you could do it and get away with it, it was considered fine. He was taking the things that he knew from the society that he was raised in and trying to move these into his Christian life. He did, see, he didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Thessalonians. He didn't have that. All he had was the teaching and preaching of Paul, Apollos, and some of the others who had been down there. He didn't understand all of the things that was needed to be understood. And Paul, as he is writing to Corinth, he's trying to help the church out. Now, of course, Paul thought that he was doing this as Paul. We all know that. We all know that the Holy Spirit of God saw Dick. Saw that Dick needed some understanding and some education and some information so that at Ranko, he could be a proper Christian. God saw Jim as a Christian at PPG Industries. And it was rough, wasn't it, Jim? <laughs> that was a tough bunch that we were involved with down there. I had the privilege, and, and if you want to call it that, of being saved a week before I went there. So I started out as a Christian. Jim started out as a non-Christian, got saved, and then they, Jim got saved? Woo! Is the world turning over or what? <laughs> Jim turned out to be a good Christian witness at PPG. I'm glad to have been associated with him as a good Christian witness at PPG. But you see, the Holy Spirit saw each one of us and saw our need for good knowledge, for good understanding. So Paul wrote this under the guidance and under the direction and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that we would have this and he starts out here <coughs> telling us about how we're going to be, to, he was going to be together. That the, that the church of Corinth was going to be all one, not just with Paul's little group over here and the Corinthian church over here, but all as one. He said, first off, now he which established us with you in Christ. He's talking about being established together. Being established in such a manner, and I, and I had this discussion the other day. Uh, we were talking about how sometimes our brother, our sister, our son, our daughter, our mother, our father, how they will sometimes let us down. It happens. There are, I mean, it's just one of those things that happens. It's a, it's a blood tie. It's a family tie. But sometimes blood ties and family ties, they're not enough. I can tell you from my own personal experience, the best effort for help, for guidance, for direction, for strength, for assistance, Never came from my brother, never came from my mother, never came from my father. It came from the church. That's where I got the best reliance and the best reliability. I called Brother Jim the other day. I said, Brother Jim, can you come down and help pour concrete? He couldn't. But that's all right. I called Mike. Mike said, I'll be there. Bang, he was there. You see, God provided somebody. Maybe not the first person you call, but he'll provide somebody. And what Paul was trying to do was to get the Corinthians to understand that very concept about how we are one in Christ. The scripture says that we are neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, male or female, but we are all one in Christ. Praise the name of Jesus. You know, down here, if somebody's a little taller, somebody's a little shorter, Somebody's a little fatter, somebody ain't so fat. Somebody's a little pregnant, somebody's not pregnant. 
up there, we're all the same. Paul was a great man. Brother Jim, <laughs> I'm going to shake his hand. Moses was a great man. I want to shake his hand. And you all know where this is going. There's a lady up there. I want to hug her neck. Mrs. Noah. One of the greatest people in the Bible. We don't, we, don't, we don't even know her name. To look at what she went through. What she... You know, that conversation. And we, we, we've laughed and joked about that conversation. How he came in from the desert and told her he was going to build a boat. Okay. Okay. She loved her husband. She backed her husband. She followed her husband. She probably guided and directed him a little bit there too. Put that in there. Probably a little bit of that. But she hung in there. Paul was trying to get the Corinthian church to do just exactly that. Understand that we are one. No matter where we are. And it's a wonderful thing to think that. Now, actually, in practice sometimes, man, it doesn't work out as well as we would like to. You go off someplace and you talk to somebody else and, oh, what kind of church do you go to? I go to the Westfield Community Church. Oh, you're a Baptist. They walk away. Oh, you're a Methodist. They walk away. They don't want anything to do with you. But that's their problem, not ours. When we get to heaven, those denominational things, they're all going to be over and done with. There's no little place over here where the Baptists go, little place over there where the Catholics go, and the Methodists are back there. There's a joke that goes around about how the one place has all the beautiful music, and that's the Methodists, and they got the big beautiful buildings, and that's the Catholics, and there's this little white block building back in the corner. And the guy says to St. Peter, says, who's that back over there? And he says, shh, it's the Baptists. They think they're all alone. Don't bother. <laughs> but uh, we are one in Christ Jesus. And we have been anointed. We have been anointed. Brother Jim came up last Sunday. Anointed with oil. That God might look down on him. Take him through the surgery. We anoint to mark. We anoint to set apart that person. He said, well, why do you use a special oil? No, we use olive oil. That's all. Just plain old, common, ordinary, generic olive oil. It's not the oil and it's not the anointing. It's the separation and saying, I want to be separated. I want to be prayed for. I want God's blessing on me. Therefore, anoint me in the name of Jesus Christ and pray for me. And that's what we did. Raise your hand and say, my eyes are okay. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, a lot of us have been through that. I'm a living testimony that... Uh, my brother, who's no longer with us, just happened to be here that Sunday morning. And I asked him if he would anoint me so that I could go through my heart surgery. And he said, I was hoping you'd ask that. We did. God took care of it. But Paul was telling the people that not only are you one in Christ, but you've been anointed. You've been set apart. Some people will say, well, what kind of anointment are we anointed with? We're anointed with the Holy Spirit. Of God. The greatest oil there is, if you will. Say now, Brother Mike, what, what, does, what does the Holy Spirit do for us? He leads us, He guides us, He directs us, and if you'll listen, He'll teach you. Amen. I never spent a lot of time as a as a young person reading the Bible. Oh, I opened it up and look at it. I used to wonder when I would open it up and look at mom's old Bible. Grandma had notes in there. Always in pencil. I could tell. I could tell her. Mom would never write the Bible. I mean, the cornbread would get thrown out before we would eat it, rather than her writing the Bible. I mean, that just didn't happen. But Grandma would make little notes in there with, with her pencil, and you could always tell her old-fashioned writing. And I'd look through there sometimes, and I'd see where she wrote. And, oh, what if that's all about? Never could figure it out. Wish I had that Bible right now, Sister Linda. It'd be all kinds of fun to sit down and look at that. But uh, she would leave little notes in there. And we would try to understand what she was trying to say. But uh, as I grew older, and then after I got saved, 
I didn't have that basket of knowledge, if you will, Sister Pam. But sometimes a question would come up, something would happen. Brother Chuck, I knew the answer to that. And it wasn't because I read it. And it wasn't because I studied it. And it wasn't because somebody ta taught it to me. It was because there's a Holy Spirit of God that was trying to get me pointed in the right direction. And He will point you in the right direction every time. The Scripture says that the footsteps of a man are pointed in the right direction. Footsteps of a man are ordered by God. Got the, it's just like that order of Wendy's. So you put it in a Wendy's, you want a double cheeseburger with bacon, you're liable to get a, a frosty or something. The order doesn't always have to be followed correctly. But the footsteps of a man are ordered by God. The footsteps of a woman, the footsteps of a child are guided by the Holy Spirit. If they'll allow it. That's what we're anointed with. That's the anointing that we're given. But the most important thing of the whole thing there is the coming together and the anointing. Where is it? How is it done? And who is it done by? And where is it done? Praise God, it's done in heaven by God. Nobody else. Nowhere else. No other way. Only by the hand of Almighty God are we put together. Brother Dick sometimes laughs and jokes about how he and Sister Marlene came to church at one time and almost turned around and walked down. We had Bible study out here. We were laughing and joking. Some of you who have never been to Bible study, you don't know what you miss. We laugh and joke and carry on. We had a we had one lady out there one night, one one day we were talking. And I said, Is everybody here read all the way through the Bible? Oh yeah. Everybody's read the book of Hezekiah? Oh yeah. There was only one hand that went up on that one. Oh yeah. Oh, you read the book of Hezekiah. And uh, Dick and Marlene came in, and we were picking on this person who had read the book of Hezekiah about everything was in the book of Hezekiah. Of course, kind of. For those of you that don't know, there ain't no such thing as the book of Hezekiah. But we were having fun with her, and Dick and Marlene are sitting over there in the corner saying, we're leaving this place. But uh, the simple point is, and the point that I was trying to make, is that God will direct your path. God will set you together. God didn't let Dick and Marlene get out the door. Uh, God put it on my heart to look over at Dick and Marlene and explain to them what we were doing and we were having some fun at someone else's expense. We were picking on them, giving them a little uh, roasting, if you will. Everybody's been to a roast where Pam is the guest of honor today. And 15 people get up and tell how bad of a bus driver she is and how she burns the toast and everything else. Okay. But uh, this, this lady that was there at the church that day, we were kind of roasting her a little bit. And, it, and the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit said to me, make sure that you let everybody know what's going on here because not everybody knows. And I did. And that made all the difference with Dick and Marlene. Dick and Marlene may have walked out and never come back had I not taken the time. But again, the Holy Spirit gave me that reference to do that. But again, that's all because of the Lord. And then we go to the next scripture. Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. God has sealed every one of us. A couple weeks ago, I went out on the west side of my property there. And we took the lid off of the beehive. And we extracted a little of that good stuff out of there. I brought this in today. Isn't that pretty? Everybody knows what honey is. It's sweet. It's good stuff. It's also sealed. I put the lid on. I sealed the lid down tight. There is nothing under normal circumstances that can get in there to contaminate that honey. It sits on my shelf at home in the pantry. 
The doors are locked. Nobody can get in to steal my honey. Nobody can take it. Unless they happen to be an in-house burglar. <laughs> in real circumstances, this will be fully protected. The only thing that could happen to it would it would become internally contaminated and break the jar. Christians who are bought by the blood of Jesus are sealed just in the same manner that I put the lid on this and seal it down tight. We're sealed by the hand of God. We're sealed so that although there are things on the outside that can cause us a little worry, cause us a little anguish, cause us even a lot of grief, they cannot get inside and hurt your soul. They cannot reach inside and take that salvation that you've got. They cannot take away that pride, Brother Jim. That honey that's inside is yours. God seal that. The only way is if there's a contamination on the inside and breaks the seal. That is the only way. And I just wanted to bring this and share this with you this morning. What a wonderful thing it is, Brother Nick, to know that just like the honey in this jar, God put the lid on and sealed it. I'm the only one that can break it. Satan doesn't have. Satan and all of his angels, all of his demons, all of his devils, all of the imps of hell can't crack my salvation, can't break my salvation, can't steal or rob or pillage or plunder or rust or corrode or anything else. God gave that to me just like I put this money in the jar. And God protected, is protecting and sealing me just like this money is in this jar. At the appropriate time, we'll take the lid off, or somebody will take the lid off. Take some of it out, empty it up, clean the jar out. At the appropriate time, God's going to look down. And it may be when the seventh trumpet blows, it may be today, tomorrow, next week, next month. Sister Pam, one of these days God's going to look down and say, you know, I've got a Dwight who's up here with me. Uh, Angie, go get it. Brother Jim, don't cry for me, buddy. <laughs> Just Sandy, raise your hand and say, go for it. Hallelujah. Sister Linda, make sure you ask Lori if she got that poultry scan out. <laughs> Whatever. I'm going to be walking the streets of Florida for today. Walking with Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach. There you go. Walking with the saints of old, the saints of the New Testament. Y'all, some of you was here when we did the little one-act show of the Centurion of Capernaum. I came in with my armor, my helmet, my shield, and all that sort of stuff. I really believe the Centurion of Capernaum is going to be there also, Brother Jim. Walk down the streets with that old boy. Get to ask some questions and maybe get some answers. But like the honey in the jar, I'm sealed until that day when God says, need the wife. Just like we open up the jar, I need his money. And of course, we're given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. It's a fun thing when you look at some of the words that are in the Bible. Earnest is a synonym for interest. Interest, of course, is you've got money in the bank. And <clears throat> you got $5,000 in the bank Every six months they give you three cents and they just, oh they gave you so much interest. Yeah. 
That is what earnest is. Earnest and interest, they're synonyms. But I like the fun part about that is because in the writing of the New Testament of the King James Version, they use the word earnest, but if you go over into the dictionary, you see the synonym is interest. God gave his interest to us. God is interested in us, Sister Marley. He put his interest in us. Gave it to us. Let us know that he is indeed interested in us. Today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. I love these two scriptures. I sometimes, I, I've got one in mind and everything. I sometimes just sit and just look at it and just ponder and just say, you know, that's a pretty neat thing. It's a pretty neat thing to know that God is interested in me. Lots of people that I used to run around with, used to be associated with, you mentioned my name and they, yeah, maybe. I think I might. And you're the same way. We, we, we all are like that. You know, there are, there are people that come back in our lives, they've been gone for 20 years, they say, do you remember me? And you look at them and you know, well, um, no. We're not like that with God. He's interested in us. All the time, every time. So today, Brother White, what is the uh, what's the conclusion, so to speak, of the today's message? Well, first off, God has Himself put the church together as one unit. Always has been, always will be. Yeah, there's Catholics, Baptists, Lutherans, whatever, and some of them have some different ways that we have, and a lot of them go so far out of the ways that they won't make it into heaven. We need to pray for them. We need to help them. But the added benefit of being this one church throughout the world is that it's the same Holy Spirit that teaches, leads, and guides, and directs the Catholic as the Holy Spirit that teaches, leads, and guides, and directs the Baptist as the Holy Spirit that teaches, leads, and guides, and directs the Episcopalians. Though the Episcopalians haven't listened to them. Neither has some of the Baptists. But that's all right. God can work that out. And God will do his part to keep us together all the way to the marriage supper of the Lamb. God is going to do his part. Are we going to do our part? That's the important part. Like the honey in the jar, it's sealed by the hand of God, but it can be corrupted on the inside. Make sure that there is no corruption in your inside. As we stand this morning, Sister Sandy, Sister Rosie, come And we sing the same old song that we sing every Sunday morning, just as I am. Perhaps this morning somebody would say, Brother Dwight, I need for you to pray with me. Take me by the hand. You don't have to tell me what it's about. Maybe that you have a medical procedure. You need to be anointed. Uh, maybe that you just, just need prayer. You don't have to tell me what it's all about or anything. Just come this morning and let God reach down and help you. As they sing this morning, they say, Is there one this morning that would say, Brother Roy, take me by the hand. Take me by the hand and let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Is there one this morning?
May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Brother Jeff Rouch, would you dismiss this assembly in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have, Heavenly Father, to be in your service. We ask God that you just be with each and every one of us. Let's see the good this morning. Be with the ones, Lord, that are not here for some reason or other. Have your precious.